when you see me or somebody from Moriel engaged in conflict, it is not personal, it is doctrinal. And hello to all my brothers and sisters in the Lord across the world or wherever you're listening to this and watching this. Um, my name is Tim Worth from the Simply Agape Project, as well as Gonzo Radio. Gonzo Radio is a rock station, classic rock station online. I run that as well. Just wanted to be um, open about that. So, you know, there's always somebody going to be opposed to me. Um, I'm not feeling guilty about it. Uh, it's This is really important, you guys. I did a video video yesterday, and then I was sent a clip, a portion of a sermon, and it's a little bit of a gotcha with Jacob Prash, uh, but then I listened to the entire sermon, and brothers and sisters and any unbelievers out there, we know that there's this giant fight between uh, Morial Ministries and uh, Servius Christi, Josh, and all others involved, okay? Uh, I, I want to come out saying that I'm going to show a part of a sermon, uh, show, show more of that sermon because it's one of the best sermons I've heard in a long time. And if you ignore the sermon, you probably need to watch it. It's not me. Uh, it, of course, it's it's a great, uh, wonderful evangelist from the UK, uh, American by his accent. And I, I want you to watch this. Now, I am going to address some things after the preaching that need to be addressed, as well as uh, my NoFundMe site and uh, just a couple things I need to uh, do as far as housekeeping goes. Those will be after the sermon. The sermon is so important. We all can agree that it's hard to find a good church these days, if you're even looking. This guy addresses that, and he addresses a lot of concerns that we've all had, because I, I talk to a lot of people. So please, I'm begging you. You may not like me, and that's okay, but please listen to the sermon. And it's not about the got you part that comes toward the end of it. It's about what this evangelist is saying. It's so important for America right now, and for the entire world. Please Put your differences against me aside, and for your own benefit, if you call yourself a Christian, please listen to the sermon, and then I'll be back after that uh, for a real short, uh, shall we call it a information catch-up, and uh, some apologies as well need to go out. So uh, this sermon convicted me of sin, name-calling things I've did in my life, and even in the past months. So I want to get those off my chest. It's good to confess one and all for uh, to brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, I want you to know I do not hate Josh. I do not hate Jacob. Let's pray for him right now, even before we get started with any of this. Dear Heavenly Father, I give you all the praise and all the thanks, Lord. We know that you are on the throne. God, forgive us for all this fighting. I've been a part of it as well. Lord, forgive me of my sins and shortcomings. I pray that you uh, deal with us all, including me and uh, uh, Jacob and David Lister, all those in Moriel, as well as Josh. Uh, Josh is just a shadow of Jacob, and uh, he I, I don't think he realizes that. Please convict him of that, Lord, and help him to make things right with his wife in the eyes of God with his wife, Jolay, because she needs some closure, Lord. I pray for Joel, uh, Jolay, <clears throat> Joel as well. She did text me back and forth a little bit this morning, Lord. Please have mercy on that poor young girl and have mercy on us all. All of us could be where Josh and Jacob are. Help us to uh, have our, our fruit be the fruit of the Spirit not the fruits of the flesh. And so here's this sermon. Please watch it. I, again, I, 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 I just ask you, please, please watch it. Christians don't like to watch sermons these days. If you don't have time, it's about a half an hour or so, the section. 
And I'm going to put a link to the entire sermon. It's really good. You really need to hear it. I know a lot of you don't like me, and that's okay, but please listen to this guy. I don't know him. He doesn't know me, but I, I believe in his heart, he's speaking what God wants all of us to hear. I believe this is a worldwide message, and I believe it's important, so please watch it. Our young people in particular, they need to experience the power of God. Lament and mourn and weep. Be desperate, repent, confess, be broken. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Why don't you turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and let's look at where this all began quickly. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made, verse 1. And he said to the woman, Has indeed God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the devil is cunning, remember. The devil is smarter in many ways than any of us are, or will be in this life, because he has been in the unaffected presence of God at one time. He knows the workings and the ins and outs of God like, unlike any of us do. He was in his presence. He came in a cunning spirit, and he began to twist the situation for Eve. He presented it as a question. Verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she's telling the truth. She's regurgitating what she's been told here. Verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now that was part true and part lie. Because after they ate the fruit, she did not die immediately. But death came to the human race. She would die eventually, and she also now is carrying a sin nature. But the devil forgot to tell her that. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So now he's presented something to her that she, that, she, that she believes. She's been deceived. That's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2. The devil came and deceived her. She's been deceived into believing something that's not true, which is that God is withholding something from me, and there's something that he has not given me. In some way, God is not as good as I believe that he is. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Their eyes were opened in a way they were not supposed to be. Just like the first time a child looks at porn, his eyes are opened in a way he's not they're not supposed to be. The first time he sees a marijuana stick, the first time he puts alcohol upon his tongue, that's why as a parent, you should do the best you can to try to prevent them from these things, whatever it takes, especially in this social media and technology age that we live in. Her eyes were opened in a way they should not have been. We have people walking the streets, young people all up and down society. Their eyes are open in many, many ways right now. I spoke to a number of 12 and 13-year-old girls in the streets of Liverpool a few weeks ago that told me that they're bisexual, they're gay. A 13-year-old girl told me I have not come out of the closet yet to my mom. A 15-year-old boy in Maidstone boasting to me about how he performed an act on a boy, sex act. These children, their eyes have been opened but in a way they're not supposed to be opened. And their eyes are blind and darkened to the things they are to be open to. And that's why we have to go forth and tell them. That's why when my brother and I, when we go before them, we bring by God's grace lights. Excuse me. Jesus is the light of the world. In him there is no darkness. 
And for some reason, he chooses to give his spirit to us sinful people so that we might shine just some, even just a small portion of his light into this dark world. Bible says in verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves coverings. So immediately now it's time to hide. The shame and the guilt has come. But the root of all of this, folks, the root of it is pride. That's, that's the great tool that the devil has to you. The devil can't present anything good to her because he has nothing good. He is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. He can't present anything redemptive or positive to you. Nothing. All he can do is take what God has created and pervert it. And what did he play to here in verse 5? Specifically, what part of her pride? The end of verse 5. This is where I'm going with the rest of the message. Her eyes were open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. He was playing to her knowledge. And she said, there's something that I don't know. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, you don't have to turn there. One and two, I'm just going to read it. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. And I want to say this to you. I felt like the Lord wanted me to share this. Knowledge is defective in that it tends to center on self. And it, it is inadequate as a bond in personal relationships. The devil had nothing of moral value to offer Eve. So he instead offered her knowledge. He wasn't offering her fruit. He was offering her knowledge. And have you ever talked for 20 or 30 minutes or a long period of time with somebody and all you've done is exchange facts with the person and you don't really know them that well and you come away feeling like, well, I really still don't know that person because exchanging knowledge doesn't form relationship. But you talk about a person and you become vulnerable before them. You tell them who you really are. I'm going through this struggle. I have, this, this is my family situation. Can you please pray for me about this? You walk away and you feel like, I've made a friend here. I have a relationship with this person. Knowledge by itself cannot do that. And my concern today, and I'm going somewhere with this, is that in the remnant church here in this land, of which I would consider the majority of people in this room, for some there is almost an obsession with knowledge today, and an obsession to live on YouTube and to absorb as much information as possible, which really is not producing very much at all in your life. Otherwise, you'd be out in these streets talking to people. Otherwise, you would at least have the courage to stop somebody on Court Farm Road when they walk past you on the way to church when you're on your way in with the Bible on Sunday morning. If you can't even do that, I wonder what all this knowledge is producing, and I'm not condemning anybody, but it's very concerning to me. The devil is using YouTube and YouTube preachers to keep you from this. And I have a YouTube channel, which I very rarely ever promote anymore in a church, because I would rather you read this book than went to my YouTube channel. And it's not just things that are valid and Christian. There are true evangelical Christians that I know who are obsessing over the vaccine and the origins of COVID, and how legitimate is this, and spending all of their time studying these things, and watching these fringe, quote-unquote, medical professionals that claim they have a corner on the market more than anybody else does, and wasting all of their time on this, but I don't hear the Word of God being quoted. And I've said this many times before. If the devil can't get you into porn or alcohol or drugs, he'll find something else. And this is what he's doing in these last days. Eventually, we're going to be kicked off of YouTube, all of us. If, but we're not there yet. But eventually, it's going to happen. I have a dear friend in Pennsylvania who I love. He's a Christian man. And I sat down in January with him. I hadn't seen him in a while. And he said to me, 
There are underground tunnels going across the United States where children are being trafficked and raped by the elites. Trump won the state of California in the election. But Biden's not going to be inaugurated. There's going to be a shadow president. Technology's going to be shut down. You won't have use of your mobile phone after the 20th of January. You're not going to be able to fly. Store up 30 days of food and water. This is insanity. This is right-wing insanity, conspiracy, American flag-waving. This has nothing to do with God. But many Christians are living on these websites. None of this has come to pass. Because it's lies. It's not true. How are you spending your time? Just trying to absorb knowledge? Trying to get the next corner on the market about Bible prophecy? The next nugget you can get from this preacher or that preacher? I wonder what it's producing. Turn to Luke chapter 18. I'd like to hit on this issue of spiritual pride now. Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> and now Zoom meetings, of which I'm not opposed to people getting together on a call and talking about the Bible or teaching, but these things have now become an, an option. Even with church open again, these, this has become an option now. You can stay home in your pajamas and look at a screen, and it's church. But it's not church, because ecclesia is the, is the physical gathering of the believers. That's what it is. Luke 18, starting in verse 9. Also he, that's Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. <clears throat> and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, the people that gave Jesus the greatest problem in his ministry were the religious, the religious leaders, primarily the Pharisees. If you read the way Jesus lambasts the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, and you see the way he deals with the rest of the population, you can make a strong case that the Pharisees were the most evil people in the world at that time. They were the, the most satanic, wicked people on the face of the earth. And they looked the most religious. A woman caught in the physical act of adultery who was probably dragged out into the street naked, was shown more mercy than these guys were. A woman at a well who was, who was in a foreign land, who had already been married five times and was on a man number six, was shown far more mercy than these people were right here. And this is the danger, folks, of Phariseeism and spiritual pride. And this is what the devil is using amongst the remnant church in this land today. Because by and large, we are far away from what's considered apostasy, the, 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 the common sins of the culture, and we have an understanding, by and large, more than most people do. And I'm not just talking about this church. There are other ones like it across the land. Thank God for that. Thank God we've been protected and preserved from a lot of these agendas and are on the narrow path. But the danger, the danger is that the enemy comes with spiritual pride, and he has you comparing yourself to everybody around you. And that's exactly what's happening in this story. These guys, this was, this, was, this was business as usual for these two men, verse 10. Them going up to the temple to pray, this is what they always did. This was the time to put on a show. This was showtime for these guys. 
The Bible says in 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And I believe Jesus said that on purpose, as to let you know that God had no part in this. This man was alone in his own worlds. And how do we know God had no part in it? Look at his prayer. I thank you that I am not like other men. I am not like other men. An extortioner, unjust, an adulterer, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And it's true that this Pharisee, would have, this Pharisee, these guys would have fasted both on Monday and on Thursday at that time periods. But everything is about, look at what I have done. I'm so spiritual. Let's bring it into the modern day. I know every false teaching about the charismatic movements. I know every false teaching about Arminianism or everything about Reformed theology that's not perfect. I know every wrong thing about Roman Catholicism. I can tell you every preacher on television that's wrong. I come here faithfully every week. I've got even my own seat assigned for me. Some of you are even proud of that, that you know when you walk in, you've got a seat with your name on it. I come here, I give my tithe. I'm part of Court Farm Evangelical Church. God's not impressed. He's not impressed. Verse 13, here's the polar opposites. And the tax collector standing afar off. This guy, he didn't even feel worthy to come near the inner, the inner parts of the temple because he knew how sinful he was. Would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. See, the tax collector was a, a very lowly esteemed person in society at this time. Nobody wanted to see this guy. They were, they were corrupt. And went, they were the, 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 the picture of this is what we owe to a government that we don't want to serve. The tax collector. And he knows what he's really like. He knows how many people he's cheated. So he comes to the temple with humility. He can't even look up to God. He beats on his breast, which is a sign of desperation. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in the Greek, what that really means is the sinner. He sees himself as the worst sinner of all. Just as Paul the Apostle said, I am the chief of sinners. And it's interesting, Paul said that, folks, at the very end of his life. He didn't say that at the beginning. It was at the end, shortly before he's going to die, that he sees himself as the worst sinner of all. And as we progressively walk with God, we should be seeing our depravity in greater measure. But we should be seeing the goodness and the grace of God in greater measure at the same time. And it's when we see his greatness and his glory and his majesty, and thank God for all the prayers and the songs about the cross this morning. When we see the cross, we cannot help but say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, the sinner, whether you've come out of drugs and alcohol and sex, or whether you grew up as a, a past, in a pastor's home, we are all the sinner in the eyes of God. That's how we should see ourselves. Every single one of us is saved by grace. Hallelujah. That says in 14 that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? Because he was humble. Because he was looking to God and not to his own self-righteousness. Every single thing that this Pharisee professed about himself was true. He really was not any of these things. He really did do these things, but it doesn't matter. Because he's not looking at God. And if you think you can do anything, or you have done anything, or you can do anything in the future without the grace of God, you are deceived. You need his grace just as badly today, tomorrow, this week, next week, as you ever did. Sometimes we, sometimes we only give glory to God in these very difficult seasons of our lives, these trials. And we can come through on the other side and we can say, oh, God pulled me out of that. God's grace was so real to me. God's grace is always that real to you. He just knows how he needs to discipline you in some of these seasons to bring you down and get your attention. Or he knows the level of comfort and healing that you need in those situations in order to lift you back up again because you are his child. He's not going to let you go. Hallelujah. He who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who exalts himself will be humbled. Everything in us of self, of pride, has to come down. You have to allow God to deal with it, everything. 
Now, along these lines, a couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit put a man on my heart, and it just literally came out of nowhere. And I became grieved by this. And this is something I've weighed heavily in the last week. This man is a minister here in this country. He comes from the United States. And he's probably done more damage to the church of Jesus Christ in this country than any man in the last four years. And I'm not going to mention his name, not because I'm scared, but because I, he, he's so vicious and so looking for contention and conflict that if I say his name, he's going to get exactly what he wants. He has tried to destroy people's lives. He's tried to destroy people's ministries. He's driven a person to, almost to suicide. He tried to destroy a man's ministry in the Midwest, in the United States. He, destroyed, he did destroy, basically, another man's ministry here in the United Kingdom. And he has been approached by his own, uh, or he's been approached by a group of people that he used to work with on the basis of Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 to 7. And he has laughed it off. He's been challenged by numerous people individually. He's told them to leave him alone, to not reach out to him anymore. And most recently, he's at it again with a public, disgraceful rebuke of a sister on his website, full of lies and false accusations. And I am only speaking on this because God has told me to. And as I've traveled the country the last few months, I see very dear people that I love that I find out are still following this man, still getting a glimpse here and there. I'm standing here on the authority of the Word of God today. And I'm telling you, this man is vicious. He is hateful. He is vengeful. He is unforgiving. He is bitter. He is divisive. And no one that loves Jesus Christ should be watching or following this man or giving him money. And if you have any confusion about who he is, come and find me at the end and I'll tell you privately. Why do some continue to just need to get a glimpse? Pride. Because this man is operating in pride. It's all pride. There's no grace in what he, has, in what he says. There's no love. He's basically built a ministry on trashing people. But some of you think because you know every false teaching about the charismatic movement, you know every false teaching about Roman Catholicism, you know every false preacher on television, that you are avoiding the apostasy. I'm telling you, you're not. There are two sides to the apostasy. There's Bethel and Brian Houston and Joel Osteen, but then there's also this man. And this man poses as the Pharisee. He is exhibit A of pharisaical apostasy. And if the greatest opposition to our Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry up until he took his last breath was the Pharisees, will the greatest opposition against the last day's church not be the pharisaical spirits? Hear the word of the Lord today. If you continue to follow this man, the Holy Spirit has told me to say this to you. If you click on his channel, if you glimpse anything, do so at your own risk. Is this man a Christian? Let's see what the Bible says. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul's writing to the church here. 
But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous <clears throat> or an idolater or a reviler. In the King James, railer. Someone who continually rails, reviles, trashes, tears people down. Same thing, year after year. Much of it unfounded, much of it not true. Coming from a place of bitterness and vengeance and hate. Publicly, not in private, publicly. Or, an or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. Not to even eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Pretty self-explanatory, folks. What am I doing right now? I'm judging within the professing church. This is absolutely biblical. And I'm going to show you elsewhere where it's biblical. Chapter 6, if that wasn't enough for you. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. There it is for you again, folks, in two consecutive chapters. This man is in danger of hellfire right now in the condition he's in, period. He is in danger of hellfire. Thank you, Pastor, for agreeing with me. Thank you. This is very serious, folks. If you want to see a move of God in this country, you've got to distance yourself from this person as long as he behaves, until he shows some sign of repentance. Because if he doesn't, there's, if there's a revival or a move in this country, he is not going to be a part of it. I can promise you that. But he's so good on Israel. But he's so good on end times prophecy. But he's so good on, on uh, apostasy in the church in the last days. He also hates his brothers and sisters. Do you think when you open yourself up to his teaching... Do you think that when you get that little nugget of Israel, which does you no good, that little nugget on who the Antichrist might be, which does you no good in the long run, you can't help but sneak a peek, do you not also expose yourself and take in all of the pride, the bitterness, the vengeance, the hate, the unforgiveness, the unrighteous anger, the trashing of a legitimate theological position that's been around for 500 years? There's two sides to the apostasy, friends. There's this hyper grace, smoke machines and bright lights and all of this. That's the more obvious one. But there's a pharisaical apostasy. And I was meditating on why this week. And I really felt the Holy Spirit lead me to say this. And I hope you understand this in the spirit that it's given. I love Israel. And I see the biblical mandate for Israel in this book. And this church loves Israel. And there are people in this, this, in this church that love Israel greatly. But my concern today, and I feel like this is the, the phrase the Holy Spirit has given me, is that in some situations there's what I'm going to call a reverse replacement theology at work right now. Replacement theology is what we would know as the church substituting for Israel and God is done with Israel. We know that's wrong. I believe that's actually demonic. The Bible does not teach that. God has made covenant with the Jewish people. And no matter how they act or what they do, that covenant is never going to change. And he's going to pour his spirit out upon them in the last days. But today there's a reverse replacement theology that I see in some places where Israel, the love of Israel has taken place of the love of the church. And I want to remind you today that your first responsibility is right here. These people, the church, is your first responsibility, not Israel. You can love Israel, you should love Israel, you should pray for Israel. But Paul said in Romans 10, it is my desire that my brethren may be saved. He was talking about his own Jewish counterparts, 
They're not saved. They're outside of the kingdom of God. Our first responsibility as believers is to each other. I am an evangelist, but according to Ephesians 4 and verse 11, my first responsibility is to you, not out there. Because Ephesians 4.11 says that God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My first responsibility is to you, not to Israel or to the lost in the streets of England or anybody else. Yes, pray for Israel. Read books on Israel. Find out as much as you can about how to support Israel. But do it from people that love God. Not people masquerading as ministers who are carrying around bitterness and hatred and vengeance against their brothers and sisters. You see how the enemy can use even a good thing, like our love and our support for Israel, which is completely biblical, to find an inroad in our lives. You know, I, I love studying apostasy. This is my, my thing, really. And I, I know this man is great on apostasy. And he's great on exposing these things. But I can find those things out elsewhere. 1 Timothy chapter 5. What am I doing here exactly? If you have any question about the validity of this. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Starting in verse 20. Those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. Are you scared this morning knowing that this has happened to this man that many of you have followed? Are you scared? You should be scared. Because if it can happen to him, it can happen to any of us. That's the purpose of this. That's the purpose of what I'm doing. Verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Paul is writing to Timothy, who was a pastor at the time. He knew these very difficult situations would come up. This guy, I've been told, this man will do anything to you. I'm putting, my, I'm putting everything on the line right now. But I'm just a lowly street preacher. I have no blog. I have no church. I have no books. I have no, no formal ministry. I have a but all I do have is a responsibility before God and Jesus and the angels to do nothing with partiality. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I love you too much to be silent. And whatever happens, let it come as it may. My brother in the Midwest in America, he's still standing. All of these people this guy has tried to destroy, they're still standing. God has brought them through his vicious attacks. See, the pharisaical spirit is a lot harder to deal with sometimes than the other side. The Pharisees don't go away easily. They fight and they claw and they, and they claim religion right up until the end. If you continue to follow this man, I believe there's, you're going to experience some level of lack of favor and maybe even judgment on your life. You're being warned by the Holy Spirit today. You can do as you please, but you're being warned. 1 Corinthians 15. Because the only way somebody like this is going to be brought down is either if you stop clicking on his video, because every click you give to one of these videos, you just inflate his already gigantic ego. Every book that you buy, every month donation you give to him, you enable him to continue doing this. Stop giving him money. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Verses 8 through 10. Paul's talking about his experience meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul says, I was fortunate enough, outside of the original disciples, I was fortunate enough to see Jesus. And I saw him in a different way than the others did. That's the expression born out of due time. It was really a, an act of grace by God that he revealed himself to Saul, a wicked man like this. He says in 9 that I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called one. Why? Because I persecuted God's people. I killed Christians. And he never forgot this, folks. He shared his testimony multiple times throughout the book of Acts. When all else would fail and the mob was pressing in, he resorted to his testimony. He never forgot what God had brought him from. He says in 10, the same thing that you and I should be saying. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Is God's grace toward you in vain today? What are you doing with the grace that he's bestowed upon you? How are you using every ability and favor and gift that he's given you? How are you using them? But it's not just grace. It's not just grace and sitting around and doing nothing. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which, with, which was with me. As, as God's grace moved and inspired and undergirded me, he says, I did the work that God was calling me to do. I've been battling something called long COVID for seven months. And I'll tell you, folks, it's been horrible, absolutely horrible. And even to stand up here for this long, it's only the grace of God. I was with Daniel for six hours in Southampton the other day. It was, it's just supernatural strength and ability that he's given me. We were on the streets. We barely, we didn't sit down the last four hours. And, but it's, but I come to a place of realizing this is not me. This is the grace of God. And I'm just hoping and praying that my body ends up getting healed. But it just doesn't seem to be happening. You have some days that are better than others. If you've struggled with this, you know what I'm talking about. But the Lord, because this is the kind of message, and I don't say this boastfully at all, this is the kind of message that I could roll out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and preach this message. Because pride used to be the, 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 the it used to be my DNA when I was a young man. I was very successful. I worked for the ESPN television network in America, which is a famous network at 20 years old as an intern. I was hired back at 22, right out of university. I was working with famous television presenters. I have won two sports Emmy awards for shows that I've worked on with ESPN. I was the first student from my university ever, male student, to complete an honors thesis uh, program at the end of my time. And I could go on and on and on. But I count all of this dung. This is my dung resume. And I was so full of pride at 21, 22, 23 years old. But I was so empty and so broken on the inside and so insecure about myself. And I covered it up with drink and with marijuana and with sex and the pubs and my friends. And then when I got out of that life and finished my uni, then it was covering it up with a job and a career, much like Adam and Eve did when they went and hid themselves in the forest with the fig leaves. And God saved me. And over the last 17 years, pride has always been the thing that continues to crop, creep back up again. And I have these moments where God just has to break me. And sometimes it's very painful. And right now I'm in a seven month breaking. <laughs> a seven month breaking. But I'm not, I don't complain about this by God's grace. He knows what's best for me. I accept even his hand of affliction in my life. Sister Linda, I don't know, I didn't really like it when you said it a few weeks ago. I was with her and her husband, and she's, she prayed, and she said, Lord, I, I know that this is you. You've done this for him, <laughs> the long COVID. But she's right. She's absolutely right. It was a word from the Lord, and I needed to hear it. Hallelujah. And when it's time to go, it's time to go. This life, this world is not our home. It's not our home. <clears throat> I look forward to the day that Jesus comes. I look forward to the day I get to meet him face to face. Okay, so uh, that was a sermon. It was really well done. It really hit me personally because I've really been struggling about the balance of uh, American politics in particular because I'm an American and uh, what's going on in the world. 
<clears throat> I'm in agreement with this brother, uh, Ryan, and I think he had it right on the head. It's about the devil playing to your, no your obsession with knowledge. Okay, because I believe people like Sandy, I know, worship precious knowledge. A lot of people will worship John Haller's knowledge on the news. But that shouldn't be where our focus is. So I think that came out during the preaching. Uh, a couple things. It's convenient, I think, that Moriel now comes to the defense of Joel when they were aware of the problems months, if not I, over a year ago. So I'm going to show you uh, at the very end of this, because I want to make this quick. Uh, at the very end of this, the uh, what they're saying now and what Jacob Prash said on Bible thunking, Thumping Wingnut uh, nine months ago. So nine months ago was a little bit of a different story than it is right now because Jacob and Josh are fighting. Don't follow either one of these guys. Anybody in, in, in Morial is like kryptonite right now and all their associates. And Josh is just an evil shadow of Jacob. If you watch how he speaks to other people who even slightly disagree with him, that is not Christ-like. It's in the flesh. I don't know what Josh is angry about. I don't know what his problem is. And that's between him and God. But he did take advantage of a young girl. And he needs to make it right to her. He needs to give Joel some closure. Also, I want to point out the whole thing with the NoFundMe um, uh, website thing. I had previously said that I, I thought that Linda McIntyre, matter of fact, I was pretty insistent that she made that. Well, she sent me a screenshot. I'm going to show it to you. It was part of an email. So it really doesn't definitively, definitive, she's blaming it on Josh, of course. It doesn't definitively prove that she made it, Josh made it. It would seem that Josh gave this over to Jacob. So maybe Josh made it. I have no proof of that, so I don't know. Here's the warning. In these, in, in, he calls me a creep. You guys got to tone down the rhetoric. And I've said bad things about people too, and I confess it, calling them clowns, calling Marco a clown and all that. That's, that's not the thing we should do as Christians. And sometimes we do, and I repent of that. I'm, I'm sorry. I've called people names. I've called Linda names, and I apologize for that. But Linda has lied about me all over the Internet. I'm, I'm not sure what's wrong with this young lady. Uh, a little bit older. I, I mean, no disrespect by saying that. But you'll notice in another screenshot that I put up that I got from uh, Micah Pat Rogers that her website is now titled, uh, my, it has my name and Hugh's name. So, Linda, in passing, uh, let me uh, bring up what she said in passing so I can read it to you. Um, she says, Art Mira, you might remember him, is paying for a forensic investigation of everybody's computers and phones. He put up 20000 to him. The other was presented to a group of 89 people, Art Art. Us. Art is no longer with Morial. He wants. He has answers. He wants the truth. I'm the only one to agree with having it done. Just me. No one else agreed. I haven't. I want Vit done to clear my name. I have absolutely nothing to hide. Peter and I have even invited Art to come down from Seattle to our home to do it. No matter what you think of me, I just want the truth out, which seems to be happening. That's it, Tim. I said what I feel led to say. I wish you well and wish you blessings. And in the same thing, she sends Mike and Pat Rogers um, a screenshot which shows the uh, website she's working on against me and Hugh. So uh, Linda had, had, when she sent me the screenshot, she, she told me, I, I told you I did not do anything you're lying accusing me of. Josh did it. I've shown you uh, proof. No, uh, 
her, she, her misspelling is crazy. No apology. Stop lying or I'll have Facebook remove you. Hi, thanks for contacting us. We've received your message and appreciate you reaching out. Oh, that was my reply. Uh, she contacted me through Gonzo Radio. So, um, Linda, I'm going to put up on the screen right now. They, they can check your computer at home, but you have 10 that we know of. I, I believe it's 10. I'm going to put those up on the screen where it tracks your... Uh, email address, your two email addresses, to different IP addresses. So for you folks that aren't geeks out there, what happens is when somebody um, uh, responds on a blog, it'll show your email and their IP address. This shows it. And these are several different IP addresses. So either Linda has 10 computers at home or... I'm speculating here. She goes to coffee shops, local churches, library, whatever. I didn't track each one of these IPs down, but they're all different, which means they're all coming from different computers. So when you say, Linda, that you're going to have Art do a forensic test on your computer, or you're going to have do for forensic tents, uh, tests on these 10 others that you use, you need to repent and you need to just back it off. And Josh... When I saw this screenshot, let me look. Uh, Tim Worth Creep, that's what that's what it's titled to. To Jacob Prash. Jacob, here are several creepy comments on various celebrity accounts. He's a worldly creep in addition to a con man in Christ Joshua. Now, that's Linda's proof to show that Joshua did the NoFundMe website to try to hurt uh, my raising money uh, for the Alzheimer's thing because I, I, I no longer can work. And the first picture, Josh, is a picture of my daughter and her husband. Now you better knock it off. I'm telling you that straight up. Her husband, Brady, I haven't shared this with them because they just kind of go to church and I don't know where they're at really with the Lord. But Brady would kick you to the curb if you ever mess with Brittany. And I'm not saying you would, but you called me out because I showed the original tape before on calling Brittany beautiful. She's my daughter. She is beautiful. She has a different last name. It's called Dunlap because she got married. The celebrity stuff is some people that I've met before. One was a little bit off color, and I apologized for that online publicly. The other ones are... We're just encouraging one. I've, I've met Patricia Heaton before, one time, and Samantha Brown. Don and I met her on a cruise. So those weren't creepy things. You're making a mountain out of molehill, and you reported it to Prash. Now, do I have proof that Jacob said, okay, Josh, go after him, create the NoFundMe uh, YouTube page, which has since been bought down, which if it goes back up, it goes back up. Have you hurt my finances? Yes, you have. But God will avenge me. Josh, you're on bad ground. You need to step down as a minister. Jacob, you for sure need to go. But Josh, you're no different than Jacob. You used our stuff, mainly TBC Kawhi's, uh, the men laws. You used other people's, other people's work to prove your point. You, you deny that, but... Morial even correctly found that. Why don't you guys tear each other apart uh, and be done with it? There's, this is just the beginning, folks. I would advise you to stay away from Morial, Stay away from Josh. The way they deliver things is hateful, personal, and mean. You do not want to be near these guys. Their ministry... Or anybody involved with that, pray for them. Pray for guys like John Haller, who turned people away from Scripture and toward the news. Pray for people like Marco, who his bits are <laughs> they're just silly. It's not preaching the Word. And Jacobs did a bunch of great teachings. And again, I've had hundreds of hours 
of conversation with Jacob. I love you guys in the Lord. I get reprimanded for calling you brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm saved. February 14th, 1994, 4 o'clock, I gave my life to the Lord. That's my unbirthday. That's my spiritual birthday. I'm saved. I don't have to prove that to you guys. You guys are not my judge. You ought to knock it off. All you're doing is attacking Christians. And even though the guy in the sermon did not bring up Joshua, Josh, you're cut from the same cloth. That's what Jacob liked about you. That's why you're birds of a feather. And now you're just going to tear each other apart. Think of what you're doing to the body of Christ. Shame on you both. You need to repent. Because God's not going to put up with this. He, I don't need to do anything. God will take you out. And judge you his own way. Just like he would us. But I'm warning people. Those hardcore Die hard followers on each side who are saying, Oh, bless you. Personal things are none of their business. Blah, blah, blah. Josh, you need to make it right with your wife. You really do. You need to repent. You're married in the in the eyes of God, even though there's no official license. Talk to Joel, please. Work it out. Whatever that may be. And I'm, I'm not going to suggest what you should do. I don't know. Jacob, you've been done with ministry for a long time. And I feel sorry for you because I've had hundreds of hours of conversations. And you hurt me badly. So did Amos Farrell. But I forgive you both. And I don't ask your forgiveness or anything else. David Lister. Marco, who stabbed me in the back. John Haller who gossips about me behind my back, I forgive you guys. But you need to get the fear of the Lord in you. God is not pleased with this. What this, what Ryan said in his sermon is a good word, and you should take heed of it right now. <clears throat> Folks, let's pray for him again and pray for ourselves. Any one of us could be here with the same mistakes. God's not being fooled. God knows everything that goes on. So we're all at fault one, one way or another. And God, forgive me first <clears throat> for getting down in the dirt, doing things the same way that Josh and Jacob do with the name calling, stuff that is not of you, that works of the flesh. Lord, I am really sorry. But I, I would ask you, if any of these leaders are not saved, that you would save them. Save them from hellfire. I pray for Jacob. I pray for Ellie. We shouldn't take shots, folks, at people's families, kids, stuff like that. Pavia, Lord, I, I pray you put a hedge of protection around Pavia as well as all this stuff goes through, goes, or goes through. Lord, I pray for Josh. I pray for him and his lovely wife, uh, Joelle. Lord, whatever it takes to put conviction in this young man's heart, please have him make it right with his wife. I pray for Sandy, who's putting his head in the sand or someplace else. Sandy, you need to repent, man. I've said this more than once. This is not gonna this is not gonna go good. Please repent, my friend, my brother. One who I've stuck side by side from. I love you guys. It may not seem so, but you hate me because I tell the truth. Pray, Sandy, I pray for Rose and Cassie and Clarissa and Josh, uh, Josiah, I mean. Uh, and uh, Lord, have mercy on us all, Lord. We could all be here. None of us are better than Josh or Jacob or any of these folks, Lord. And we could all be in the same spot, Lord. I pray that you bring them to repentance. And if ever, any of them are on, not safe, please save them from hellfire. I've had hundreds of hours of conversations with Jacob. I've seen lovely side of him. He loves people. He's gotten away from that, and I'm not sure why, but you know. Please save him. Save him from hellfire, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. So I'm going to show the clips now.
not to not to that I got to uh, say. Well, this some kind of vindication on my part. God will do that. But I just want to put the truth out there, Linda. You're not telling the truth. You need to repent. Pray for Linda too, folks. She's John Haller's uh, uh, coordinator of their uh, volunteer of their comment section. She needs Jesus too, because she she doesn't tell the truth a lot. And uh, Lord, help sort out her mind. Lord, have mercy on her and Peter and anybody's kids. But most of all, Lord, have mercy on the body of Christ who's seeing this and the ones that are agreeing with one side of another or another, one side or another looking for the scraps. They're a couple of alpha wolves just tearing each other apart. Bring gentleness, kindness, the fruits of the Spirit into their hearts, Lord. Help them to man up, get the spine to repent, and retire. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.